Good morning. Welcome to lesson one of our study of the book of Revelation. That's the fourth time I've said that. The first time was in 1991. My fourth time to teach this book and I've been looking forward to it. We just finished our study of the book of Zechariah and all of the uh, notes and audio and handouts have now all been posted to the website if you'd like to look at any of that. And uh, all of our notes and audio, etc., for this class will also be posted to the same website, which is www.revelation.study. Not .com or org or net, but .study. Revelation.study. And if you forget that, you can go to the church's website, and there's a link to it on the um, class Bible class homepage. Let's begin our class with a prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this beautiful day you've given us, Father. We're thankful for this opportunity we have to study your word, to meet together, have fellowship with one another, and to worship you. Father, we're thankful for this wonderful book of Revelation that you've given us, Father, and our prayers that we will study it diligently and carefully, Father, and understand the great messages of hope and victory that you have in there for, for us, Father. We're thankful for that book, and we're thankful for this opportunity we have to study it. Father, we're, we're mindful of many who are traveling today. We pray you will be with them and bless them in their travels. They will make it to their destination safely. And Father, most of all, we're thankful for Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. What is Revelation? That seems like an odd question to ask about a book of the Bible. We didn't ask, what is Zechariah? But we probably should start by asking, what is Revelation? It's, it's like few other books in the Bible. I think we could all agree with that. Uh, is it prophecy? Is it history? Is it literal? Is it figurative? Is it art? Um, just what is it? I thought it would be helpful maybe to start off with some answers that some have given to that question. Not all of these answers I agree with, but let me tell you what some have said on that question. What is it? Uh, Philip Carrington wrote, In the case of Revelation, we are dealing with an artist greater than Stevenson or Coleridge or Bach. John has a better sense of the right word than Stevenson. He has a greater command of unearthly supernatural loveliness than Coleridge. He has a richer sense of melody and rhythm and composition than Bach. It is the only masterpiece of pure art in the New Testament. Its fullness and richness and harmonic variety place it far above Greek tragedy. So he, he certainly saw the book as, some, as a work of art, which I, I think it is. It is much more than that, though. Uh, novelist Will Self wrote a, an, a, an introduction to a pocket edition of the book of Revelation. And here's what he wrote. In its vile obscuritanism is its baneful effect. The original language may have welded the metaphoric with the signified, the logos with the flesh. But in the King James Version, the text is a puppet show of tedium, a portentous horror film. Remember, I told you I disagreed with, with some of these. That's one. Uh, Hal Lindsey, who I've mentioned a few times in our book, our study of Zechariah, wrote a lot of uh, popular um, books on prophetic events. Uh, he, here's what he wrote in 1973. The information in the book you are about to read is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. I can say this with confidence because the facts and predictions in the next few pages are all taken from the greatest source book of current events in the world, meaning the Bible. Of course, uh, if he wrote if, uh, that in 1973, and since then he has updated his facts, etc., from that source book. So uh, I think his, uh, his view of the book seems to change with the headlines. Uh, William Barclay, uh, he said, he described Revelation as the strange book. Here's what he wrote. When a student of the New Testament embarks upon the study of Revelation, he finds himself projected into a different world. Here is something quite unlike the rest of the New Testament. And not only is it different, but it is notoriously difficult for a modern mind to understand. As a result, it has sometimes been abandoned and has instead become the playground of religious eccentrics. One despairing commentator said that there are as many riddles in the Revelation as there are words. And another that the study of Revelation either finds a man mad or leaves a man mad. Another wrote, there is a choral, symphonic nature about the book of Revelation that stirs up our feelings as much as it does our ideas. It is dramatic, forceful, yet surprisingly tender and comforting. 
Another said, beautiful beyond description is the last book of the Bible. Beautiful in form and symbolism and purpose and meaning. And finally, one wrote, the Greek title of this book is Apocalypsis, which means uncovered. But readers may feel that not much is revealed. The book of Revelation appears not to accomplish what its title promises, confusing its readers by all of its images, figures, and numbers they encounter. So what is Revelation? There are some answers. I think as we go through the text, verse by verse by verse, we'll come up with our own answer to that question as to what is Revelation. Uh, but there are as many answers to that question as there are commentaries. What is Revelation all about? What is it all about? Well, either Revelation is almost totally neglected, or it is elevated to a, a prominence shared by no other biblical book. That seems to be the choice that many people make with the book. Uh, but we're going to find that Revelation fits perfectly into the canon. It's part, of the, it's part of the Word, and it fits perfectly in, and we shouldn't neglect it, but then also we shouldn't elevate it to some prominence above the other books, um, as many do. No other part of the Bible, no other book of the Bible, has proved so fascinating to commentators, uh, or has suffered so much at their hands. So we need to be very careful about the book of Revelation. What's it all about? I think if you stop the average man on the street and ask him, what is the book of Revelation all about? You would hear the answer, it's all about the end of the world. And perhaps that's what we're going to find as we study this book. But perhaps we should also heed the advice of uh, that famous theologian Mark Twain uh, when it comes to the book of Revelation. He said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's probably time to change sides. And when you find yourself on the side of the majority of commentaries about Revelation, that's something to think about. Maybe I do need to change sides. Perhaps a good starting point for our study of Revelation is to understand that not every verse in the Bible that sounds like it's talking about the end of the world is talking about the end of the world. And we talked about some of that in our study of Zechariah. Uh, Matthew 24, 29, and 30 is a very good example of that. Uh, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. That sure sounds like the end of the world, doesn't it? And yet if you just keep reading to verse 34, you find that all-important time frame in Matthew 24 Verse 34 tells us that what we just read from verses 29 and 30 happened in the first century, in the generation of those listening to Jesus as he said that. Now that prophecy happened in AD 70 with the fall of Jerusalem. Is Revelation describing that same event? No, I don't think it is. In fact, I think Revelation was written after the fall of Jerusalem, and that's going to be one of the questions we talk about in the introduction. Uh, but Matthew 24 provides a time frame for that prophecy, and we're going to find that Revelation provides a time frame for its prophecies as well. That's the key point here. The language in Matthew 24 is language describing judgment. In fact, in that case, it's the judgment against Jerusalem that came in AD 70 that Zechariah told us a lot about when we just studied the book of Zechariah. But there are a lot of judgments in the Bible, a lot of judgments in the Bible. Sodom, Gomorrah, Egypt, Edom, Tyre, Sidon, uh, Babylon, Assyria, Judah, Israel, Jerusalem, Rome, the end of the world. There are many, many judgments in the Bible. And what we find when we look at those judgments scattered throughout the Scriptures is that they are described in very similar language, very similar language. That's why we need to be very careful when we study the book of Revelation or any book in the Bible that we identify the judgment that's being discussed, and we look for the time frame, we look for the context, and we use that to interpret what we're reading, and not just the fact that it kind of sounds like the end of the world, therefore it must be talking about the end of the world. We know that would lead us astray in Matthew 24, and I think that would lead us astray in the book of Revelation also. We may find that it's talking all about the end of the world, but we need to figure that out from what the text says, and the context, and the time frame, and not just the fact that it kind of sounds like the end of the world. Uh, if anyone ever tells you that, well, such and such language in Revelation can only be describing this. You hear that a lot in commentaries. Well, it can only be describing this. If anyone ever tells you that, pick up a concordance and look up that language. And I think what you're going to find is that that same language is used elsewhere in the Bible to describe other things, different things, other judgments. 
So we need to be careful about making some grand pronouncement about Revelation just based on the language that's used and not looking at the context and the time frame and the point the book is trying to tell us here. But back to our question, what is Revelation all about? Well, one thing we can say for sure with absolute certainty is that Revelation is about Jesus. Revelation is about Christ. Some of the most beautiful and wonderful titles and images of Jesus found anywhere in the Bible are found right here in this book of Revelation. The faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings on earth, the first and the last, the living one, the true one, the one with the key of death, the one with the key of David, the lion of Judah, the lamb that was slain, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and Omega, the bright morning star. All of those are descriptions of Christ that we find here in this beautiful book of Revelation. But Revelation is not just a book about Christ. Revelation is also a book about the kingdom of Christ, about the church of Christ, about the church. Some of the most beautiful descriptions of the church you will find anywhere in Scripture are found right here in this beautiful book of Revelation. And we're going to be studying those as we study about Jesus and about His church. Revelation is a book about Jesus. Revelation is a book about the church. Revelation is a book about judgment, about judgment. And how do those three topics come together in this book? Christ, the church, and judgment. How do they come together? In a word, they come together in victory, in victory. And Revelation is a book about victory. The church is victorious over its enemies through Christ, through its head, through Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in many ways, that verse is a summary of what Revelation is about. Why should we study the book of Revelation? We're about to spend some significant time studying this book of Revelation. Why should we invest that kind of time in the book of Revelation? Well, there are a lot of reasons. The first main reason, of course, is that it's a book in the Bible. It's the Word of God. So whatever book we're spending time on, it's a good investment in time to spend it studying the Word of God. But there are some particular reasons, I think, that apply with particular force to the book of Revelation. First, few evangelistic tools are more helpful than a knowledge of the book of Revelation. Just placing a commentary on your desk at work can create opportunities and open doors as people look at it and then ask you questions about it. Uh, it can be a great evangelistic tool. It can be a great door opener. People out there in the world are interested in this, and they may come in here to hear it, or they may want to hear it from you, but they're interested in it. It's a topic they're interested in. But of course, we can't stop there with the interest. We have to know how to answer their questions once they ask them, and that's why we need to spend the time studying this book so we can answer their questions. Second, as I just said, people out there are interested in Revelation, and that's another reason to study it. There's a great deal of interest in it. Historian Timothy Weber tells us that a resurgence of interest in prophetic events um, is one of the most significant developments in, in religion in America since World War II. Uh, this fact, he says, is evidenced by the rising flood of, of books and popular literature about the end of the world, which has only continued to grow over the years since then. Um, uh, one of the most widely distributed books, and also I think one of the most damaging and false books, is Hal Lindsey's uh, The Late Great Planet Earth. Um, which sold many millions of copies in the 70s. And uh, that led to one publisher in Newsweek saying there is a boom in doom. So uh, I think a lot of people are, are following the mighty dollar in their view of Revelation. And I think uh, Hal certainly did, Hal Lindsey. That book was translated into 31 different languages. Um, there's widespread interest, popular interest in the book of Revelation. And now, unfortunately, most of that interest is based on a radical misunderstanding of the book, in my view. Uh, but if we can answer people's questions about that difficult book, then maybe they will trust us about other things as well. If we can answer their questions about Revelation, then maybe they will listen to us when it comes to God's plan of salvation. So again, it can be a great door opener, but it can also then lead us on to other questions they may ask. And they may then trust us uh, to answer these other questions. Uh, a third reason to study Revelation is that it, it is incredibly, incredibly interesting. Interesting. If you enjoy Bible studies that cause you to search for clues throughout the Scriptures, then you're going to love the study of the book of Revelation. 
Uh, if you enjoy the study of history, and particularly a Roman history, uh, you're going to love uh, Revelation and church history as well. Um, there are many, many wonderful, interesting things that you will dive into, as, as we will dive into, as we study uh, the book of Revelation. Um, a fourth reason to study Revelation is that it is incredibly beautiful. It is an incredibly dramatic book. Um, you know, there are some today that think we need to add drama to the gospel, that we need all maybe special music or dim the lights or some kind of, we need to add some drama. We need to kick things up a notch and add some drama. The Bible is already dramatic enough. We don't need to add drama to God's word. Uh, it does not need any help from us. How exactly does man increase the drama of a story that involves incarnation, death, resurrection, and ascension of deity? I mean, that's the scriptures. It's dramatic enough without our, our help. Simply reading the book of Revelation from the pulpit would provide more drama than any play or musical that man could ever write. Um, this book contains images that outdo much of what you would see in a movie or, or in Hollywood. Uh, blood and horror. Well, Revelation 14 tells us about a river of blood 200 miles long that comes up to a horse's bridle. Uh, fierce creatures, how about seven-headed beasts and dragons? Success of the underdog, how about the church versus the greatest political and military power the world had ever known? Happy ending, how about a victorious church, comforted and triumphing over, over that mighty enemy? Uh, Revelation is beautiful, and it is dramatic, and it is a wonderful book to study. Does it matter what we believe about Revelation? Can't we all just agree to disagree when it comes to this final book in the Bible? Well, yes, up to a point. I'm certainly going to give you my opinions on various things and try to support them from the text. But, you know, we could agree to disagree about whether the villain in this book is Rome or Jerusalem. There are different views on that. Uh, we could agree to disagree about when the book was written. I have my view, and, I'll, and there are other views about that as well. But we can't agree to disagree when it comes to theories about this book that violate other scriptures. And there are many, many such theories. We've talked about one already in our study of Zechariah, and that's premillennialism. Premillennialism. Uh, that involves much more than just a thousand year reign of Christ. Premillennialism has consequences that run counter to the heart of the gospel. So we can't just disagree, agree to disagree when it comes to theories uh, that belittle the church or that denigrate the plan of God. Many of the false theories about Revelation come more from Hollywood than from the biblical text itself. Uh, Revelation has permeated our modern culture. Uh, there are many people who can't name the first four books of the New Testament, but they can tell you quite a bit about 666. Um, Revelation forms the basis for virtually all of these so-called end is near predictions by the end is near prophets. Um, many feel that the Middle East, and particularly Israel, is going to play some great role at the end of time. Uh, we looked in our study of Zechariah at what's going to happen at the end of time and what the Bible tells us about it. And for starters, there's not going to be some great battle. I mean, we did, there's, that's not listed. That's not among the things that's going to happen at the end of the world. Um, but many people see that uh, in, in this text, and they also saw it in Zechariah. Uh, Here's a list of book titles from the 1980s and 1990s. I first, as I mentioned, first taught this book in 1991. And here were some of the uh, book titles. Armageddon Oil in the Middle East. Iraq in Prophecy. Holy War for the Promised Land. Prophecy 2000, Rushing to Armageddon. The Rise of Babylon, Sign of the End Times. Global Peace and the Rise of the Antichrist. The Coming Russian Invasion of America. Uh, the New Millennium, Road to Armageddon, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is in 1988, and the much-anticipated and probably unexpected sequel, The Final Shout, Rapture Report 1989, and The Late Great Planet Earth, as I mentioned. He came out with a new edition in the 80s to update his prophetic view. Um, yesterday, I did another Amazon search. Fast forward from 1991 to 2017, nearly 2018. Here are some of the titles I found. The Book of Revelation Decoded. Revelation Deciphered. The Book of Revelation for Dummies. The Book of Revelation for Blockheads. The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Book of Revelation. Unlock, unlocking the Last Days. Final Warning. The Trumpet Days of Revelation are here. 
hold your horses, the four horsemen of Revelation re-examined. And one that actually caught my eye, Hillary, Hillary Rising, the specter of absolute power in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. She didn't rise very far. <laughs> Did she? So, uh, one book that I purchased recently is entitled Armageddon, Oil, and Terror. And it's by a man named John Wolverd, um, who's dead now. But at, when he was around, he was the leading premillennialist. Um, he kind of wrote the premillennialist Bible. Um, and that book that he wrote uh, listed 12 catastrophic events that will supposedly take place uh, as part of the fulfillment of Revelation. And here's what he wrote in the introduction of that book. The rapidly increasing tempo of change in modern life has given the entire world a sense of impending crisis. How long can world tensions be kept in check? As alarming as these events are, they really are not surprising in light of the Bible's end time prophecies. That's what he wrote in a book that was just recently published. Um, here's what another end is near book says. It is impossible for the most thoughtless to overlook the impressive and almost unprecedented character of the age in which we live. Events as rapid in their succession as they are startling in their magnitude chase each other like waves on the sea. Those two quotes sound a whole lot alike, don't they? I mean, look around us. The world is in a mess. Things are accelerating. This must be the end of the world. When, did, when was that second quote written? The second one. The second quote I just read was written in 1865 at the height of the U.S. Civil War. And that person writing then said, look, it has to be the end of the world. Just look around us. People have always said that. They have said that every generation. They always look around and say, this must be it. It's the end. Uh, Wolverd said that. Someone said it a hundred years before him in the Civil War. They've always said that. The first time I taught this class, as I said, was around 1990. And we were at war with Iraq, the ancient site of Babylon. Popular books at the time told us that the locusts and Revelation were smart bombs. They told us that, that Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist. The second time I taught Revelation was in the aftermath of Janet Reno's war with Waco. And you'll remember that David Koresh had crazy ideas about the seven seals. And you'll remember how the national media particularly enjoyed heaping ridicule on the Bible at that time. The third time I taught this book, we were once again at war with Iraq. And once again, the preachers were shouting, the signs are clear, the end is near. Now, my fourth time to teach the book, and the famous doomsday clock, I looked it up. It were two and a half minutes to midnight, and we're told that planetary destruction is closer than it's ever been, and the false prophets are once again telling us the end is near. One thing you can say about those false prophets, they are consistent. They are consistent. They have been saying that for millennia. Do we really believe, do we really believe that the Word of God changes with today's headlines? That changes with the newspaper that arrives at our house every day? Is that what we believe? Is that what we want the world to believe about the unchanging Word of God? It does matter what we believe about this book of Revelation. Do misconceptions about Revelation make any difference? Well, they certainly could. They certainly could. I was, a, I was and remain a big fan of Ronald Reagan. But here's what he said when he was president. I sometimes believe we're heading very fast for Armageddon. He told People Magazine in 1983 that theologians have been studying the ancient prophecies, what would pretend the coming of Armageddon, and have said that never in the time between the prophecies up until now has there ever been a time in which so many of the prophecies are coming together. There have been times in the past when people thought the end of the world was coming, but never anything like this. Is it possible that some president or some other political leader will see themselves as accomplishing something that's in this book when they've misconstrued it? Uh, I think there's a danger in that. And I think there's a danger in misunderstanding any part of the Bible. And as I mentioned, premillennialism comes mainly from a misunderstanding of Revelation and a misunderstanding of Zechariah. We're studying both of those books. So if anyone ever comes up with some premillennial doctrine and talks to you about it, I'm hopeful that after the end of these studies, we'll all be ready to uh, respond to that because that is a very, very widespread uh, belief today. Well, who wrote Revelation? That's not a question we're going to spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, Revelation 1, 1 and 2 tells us the author was John. 
doesn't tell us which John, um, but we're told he bare record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Um, I don't think that could be anybody else but the Apostle John, is that, and that's who I think wrote this book. There is quite a bit of external evidence from the writings of, uh, of the early church about who wrote Revelation. Um, they say that uh, later in life, John, the Apostle John, moved uh, from Palestine to Ephesus. Um, there, they say, he wrote the fourth gospel and the three epistles that bear his name. Uh, he was uh, uh, exiled to Patmos during his persecution. Uh, most of these external sources say he was exiled by Domitian, Roman Emperor Domitian. There he wrote uh, Revelation. Uh, the external sources say after Domitian's death during the reign of Nerva that he was released back to Ephesus and there he died. Um, we're going to talk more about the dating of those events later in our introduction, but that's what the external evidence says. Uh, the church, church's view has been almost unanimous throughout history that the Apostle John wrote this book. And I think as we read it, we'll, we'll see there's some internal evidence to that effect as well. Um, I think the Apostle John uh, wrote this book, of course, writing by inspiration. What is the time frame of Revelation? If you've been in any of my classes so far, you should not be surprised when I ask that question. What's the time frame? And the next question after that is going to be, what's the context? What's the time frame? What's the context? Those two, those two questions carried us through the very difficult book of Zechariah, and they're going to carry us through this book of Revelation as well. What is the time frame of Revelation? The time frame is vital to understanding any prophecy in the Bible. Any prophecy in the Bible, you need to look for that all-important time frame. Absent a time frame, we get what I like to call the Nostradamus effect. You've heard of Nostradamus. He's that ancient uh, prognosticator who gave all these prophecies, and people like to say they've all been fulfilled at various times. Nostradamus didn't give any time frames. He'd just say, well, a king's going to rise, and he's going to have two sons, and one of the sons is going to kill the other son, and then they're going to get into a big fight. <laughs> I mean, what does that tell you, right? I mean, you could take that prophecy and run it along the historical timeline and have all sorts of matches. But what if Nostradamus has said that would happen in such and such a year? Okay, then you're talking. Then when you give a time frame to a prophecy, that's when things get interesting. Nostradamus did not do that. The Bible does. The Bible gives time frames when it comes to the prophecies in the Bible. Um, and the, you know, one of the big problems with a prophecy without a time frame is how do you ever prove it wrong? Right? They'll just say, well, it hadn't happened yet. It's going to happen. Um, when it's a time frame, it's pretty easy to prove wrong. The time comes, it passes, it hadn't happened, then it was wrong. So, you know, the fact that that the Bible has time frames gives it much more credibility, much more credibility. And in fact, Revelation has a time frame. In fact, it has a very clear time frame. Now, I will say it's a widely ignored time frame, but it's very clear. It lacks for nothing when it comes to clarity. Let's look at it. It happens at least four times in the book, starting with the very first verse, Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, shortly come to pass. Well, skip down two verses, Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that keep the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand. Okay, well, maybe that's just when it's all going to start, and then maybe it's going to take a long time, and then at the end, there's going to be a different time frame. Well, let's check. Flip over to the end of the book, Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse 6. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Shortly be done. And then skip down a few verses, Revelation 22, verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Two different Greek words are used in those four verses. Takos, in verse 1 of chapter 1 and verse 6 of 22, and ingus, in verse 3 of chapter 1 and verse 10 of 22. Takos means a brief space of time. Ingus means uh, a, a literally or figuratively a near place or time. Those words occur elsewhere in the Bible. Let's see how they're used there. Luke 18, 7 and 8. 
And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Speedily. That's the same word that we see in the very first verse of the book of Revelation. Acts 12, verse 7. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. Quickly. Get up quickly. It's the same word that's found in the first verse of Revelation. Acts 22, verse 18. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. Same word, quickly. Acts 25, verse 4. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself would depart shortly. Same word. And finally, Romans 16, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Shortly. Same word. Ingus means near, literally or figuratively. Near in place or near in time. That word is found 30 times in the New Testament. It's translated nigh, at hand, nigh at hand, near, nigh unto. Here's some examples of that word. Matthew 26, 18. The master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. At hand. Mark 13, 29. So you in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. It's near, it's close. John 2.13, the Jews' Passover was at hand. The exact same word. Romans 10.8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Nigh thee, the same word. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The same word. The Greek word means near, in place, or time. The Lord is at hand, Philippians 4, verse 5. He's close to us. He's near. It's the same word. The meaning of those Greek words would not be disputed and is not disputed in any other context except right here when it comes to the book of Revelation. Why are they disputed here and nowhere else? They're disputed here because they do not agree with men's interpretation of this book and their preconceived notions of this book. Let's let the text tell us what the book is all about and when it's going to occur. Many commentaries ignore or try to explain away those very clear time frames. We're not going to do that. If we begin our study of Revelation by ignoring the time frame in the very first verse, what hope do we have of ever understanding this book? Wolverd recognizes the proper meaning of the term, but then he proceeds to ignore them. Hines inserts a word to have John say that there are things that would shortly begin to come to pass, but that's not at all what John said. Others say it means that the events in the book would happen quickly once they get started, but again, that's not at all what the text says. The time frame in that last one I read you, Revelation 22, verse 10, that's particularly instructive. Revelation 22, verse 10. In that verse, John was told to seal not the sayings of this prophecy. Why? Because the time is at hand. Don't seal them up, John. Don't seal them up because the time is at hand. That's what he was told in Revelation 22, verse 10. If we go back and look at the prophecies of Daniel, something else we studied, and they're also available on the website. If you go back and look at those prophecies, you'll remember we looked at a vision there that Daniel received in 550 B.C. Uh, that's described in Daniel chapter 8. And it was fulfilled 400 years later in 165 B.C. when Antiochus Epiphanes uh, desecrated the temple and it was cleansed after that. About uh, 400 years between the prophecy and the fulfillment in Daniel 8. What was Daniel told in Daniel 8.26? Daniel was told to shut up the vision, seal up the vision. Why, Daniel? Because it's a long way off, Daniel was told. Seal it up, it's a long way off. A long way off in Daniel 8 was 400 years. Here in Revelation 22, verse 10, John is told precisely the opposite. Precisely the opposite. John, don't seal it up because the time is at hand. The time is at hand. Um, 400 years was a long way off in Daniel, and yet how many people today say that nothing in Revelation has happened yet, and it's all yet future, 2,000 years and counting? Does that make any sense in light of the time frames we've looked at and Daniel 8.26, where Daniel was told the opposite, 
with regard to a prophecy that was 400 years off. But some might ask, what about 2 Peter 3, verse 8? that says that a thousand years is like a day to God. Well, that verse tells us that time does not mean the same thing to God that it means to us. And we already knew that, but that's what that verse tells us. Um, but in Revelation 1, verse 1, in Revelation 1, verse 3, in Revelation 22, verse 6, and in Revelation 22, verse 10, God is not talking to himself. God is talking to us. God is talking to that first century church that needed a message of comfort, that needed a message of victory over their enemies. Whose time frame do we think God was using in those verses? God was using our time frame. He was using man's time frame, the same time frame he was using when he talked to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8. Uh, God was using man's time frame. Everything about this book, and we're going to see other examples as we go through the text itself. I just gave you the ones at the beginning and the ones at the end. But as we go through this text, everything in it is shouting, soon, 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 near. Let's pay close attention to that time frame. Now, we may go through this and find out that something's talking about the end of the world. We'll see. But let's don't start off by ignoring the time frame. Why was Revelation written? In studying any book of the Bible, one should always begin with that question. Why was this book written? What was its initial purpose? Who was its initial audience? What was it initially intended to do? Well, a short answer to that question is that the book of Revelation was intended to provide hope and comfort and a message of victory to the people of God who were suffering persecution at the hands of the Romans. Uh, the book was written to convince the church that God had not forgotten them, that God had not abandoned them. Um, it was written to convince them that the victory was theirs, that despite everything they saw around them, theirs was the victory, that they would be victorious. If I had to point to a theme from the book itself, I would point to Revelation 6, verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That's the question. Revelation is the answer to that question. And I would also point to Revelation 17, 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Revelation 6, verse 10 is the question. The book of Revelation is the answer. Revelation 17, 14 is a summary of that answer, that, that the church will be victorious because the church belongs to Christ. We're going to have a lot more to say through our study about the theme of this book and what it meant to its original audience. But one thing we can say right now, Right now, one thing we can say right now is that we should be very wary of any view of this book that, that makes our own generation the focus and that ignores the generation that first read it. And there are so many views of this book that do that, that say, we're it and they're not it. Well, believe me, they were it. <laughs> they were the ones being persecuted by Rome. They were the ones that needed that message of comfort and hope and victory. Now, that's a message for us also. But if our view of this book divorces the book from its initial readers, then our view is wrong. Our view needs to make sense with the initial persecuted Christians that read this book and looked to it for a message of comfort and hope and victory. God was not comforting them by telling them about some great battle that would happen 2,000 or more years later involving Saddam Hussein and, 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 and smart bombs. That was not God's message to those people. Their persecution was a first century persecution. It was a first century problem. And this book gives them a first century answer. Now, Revelation was written, as I say, to provide hope and comfort and a message of victory to the church. And in that sense, it's a very important message to us today. And we're going to find that Revelation is very relevant to us today. But we can't divorce it from its initial readers. If we do, we've taken a wrong turn. What is the context of Revelation? We've talked about the time frame. That's our first, always our first question. Our second question is always, what's the context? Time frame, context, time frame, context. If we keep asking that question, we're going to go right through this book, just like we did through Zechariah, and we're going to have a good understanding of it at the end. Uh, where we go off the rails is when we forget the time frame and we forget the context. But let's keep those in mind. What is the context? Well, let me ask a related question. And at first, it's not going to sound like a related question, but it is a related question. Is the book of Revelation one book or two books? Well, I think we'd all agree it's one book. And yet, 
sometimes we, and I'm certainly including myself in that, we treat it like two books. We treat it like two books. And of course that's a mistake. Revelation is a unified text, it's one book. But in what way do people often treat Revelation as two books? The answer is they drive a wedge between chapter three and chapter four. And what you've got is you've got the letters to the seven churches over here, and then a totally different book with a bunch of visions in it. And it's like two separate books with a big wedge driven between chapter three and chapter four. That's wrong, it's one book, it's one book. But how is that issue related to our question, which is what is the context of Revelation? What's the context of Revelation? The answer is that chapters two and three are the context of Revelation. Chapters two and three are the context of Revelation. Chapters two and three contain the letters to the seven churches of Asia. They are the context of Revelation. Those letters provide detailed descriptions of what was happening in the cities that first received this book of Revelation. It was specifically directed to them and then to all the churches, but they received it first. Those seven letters give us the all-important context of this book. If our view of the vision in chapters 4 through 22 doesn't make sense when viewed alongside the letters in chapters 2 and 3, then our view of the vision is wrong because it has to make sense. This is one book. Those letters are not a separate book. They, they give us the context of what's about to follow here. Let me give you an example of that. Soon we're going to consider the, the question of who's the villain in the book of Revelation. Who's the villain? In my view, the villain, the earthly villain, is Rome, the Roman Empire, and particularly the Roman emperors. Well, many, again, in my view, incorrect views of Revelation, uh, particularly some in the church, have the focus of this book being Jerusalem rather than Rome. And they have it being written before the fall of Jerusalem, and the book is focused on Jerusalem and not on Rome. And you'll see a lot of uh, commentaries that take that view. Let me ask a question. If the focus of this book is Jerusalem, then why does it begin with letters to the churches of Asia Minor? Those seven congregations of Asia Minor had little to nothing to do with the city of Jerusalem. They had everything to do with the Roman Empire, and particularly the cult of emperor worship that led to their persecution. And in fact, we're gonna see as we go through this that those seven cities were centers of emperor worship, which led to them being centers of persecution for the Christians. The fact that this book begins with letters to the churches of Asia Minor confirms that Jerusalem is not the focus of this book, but in fact, Rome is the focus of this book. They were the epicenter of that imperial Roman cult. And in fact, in 29 BC, Pergamum was the first to erect a temple to the Roman emperors. Smyrna was the second in 21 AD. Ephesus was the third, and it was especially linked to the Flavians, which is Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. If anyone ever tells you that Revelation is not focused on Rome, but is instead focused on anything else, you need to ask them about the seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor. Why do we have those letters? And the answer is we have them because they explain what follows. They give the context to what follows. So when we get to chapters two and three, which will happen eventually, although we've got some more introductory stuff to talk about, let's be sure to read those seven letters with an understanding that they're setting the stage for what follows. And let's don't divorce them from what follows, but let's link them to what follows because they're gonna explain what we're then, we'll see in that vision. Why did God include those letters? Um, why were they there? The answer is they provide the context, the all important context. If there are any today who worry that Revelation is not relevant to our modern world and that say, well, maybe we shouldn't spend that much time on it, it's just, it's, an, it's not relevant to us. Again, the opening letters answer that question too. The opening seven letters answer that question. Why? Because their problems are our problems. What they needed to hear is something that we need to hear. Uh, we have a lot in common with those early congregations. Some good, some bad. 
those seven letters peg the book of Revelation firmly to the world. In other words, that explains what Revelation is telling the world, what it's, what it's telling the church, and what it's saying about the world. That links them together. Uh, their issues with the Roman state are largely our issues. You think, oh, well, we're not being persecuted like that. Really? Did you see the headline yesterday where the court finally upheld the fine against the bakers in Oregon that refused to make a, a cake for the, the, the so-called gay wedding? They've been run out of business. That is economic persecution. And when we get to these letters we're going to, in Revelation, we're going to find that much of the persecution was economic. That they could not make a living as a Christian. Why? Because they could not be in the trade guilds. Because to be in a trade guild, you had to pinch an incense and offer it to Caesar as Lord. Using the same word, kurios, that's used in the New Testament for Jesus Christ. No Christian could do that. And they'd be kicked right out of that guild. So anyone who thinks Revelation is not relevant to the modern world, pick up a newspaper. Read about those bakers. It's the same kind of economic persecution. It's happening today. And it's going to get worse. So we need the message of Revelation. It's a message for us as well. Next week, we're going to start with a big question. And that is, when was Revelation written? And in fact, what we're going to find is that our answer to that question goes a long way in determining our view of the entire book. When was it written? Next week, we'll start with that, that question. Thank you very much for your attention.